Praise God. We're going to be reading a couple of passages. Uh, one out of Mark chapter 10. The first one, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. And then we're going to read out of Acts 16. But let's go ahead and read the Mark passage first. Starting in verse 46. Mark 10, 46 through 52 says, And they came to Jericho... And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, you know, that may not, I don't, I don't want to do too much of this, but let me just... Stop for a second and, you know, that may not mean a whole lot to everybody that would that's sitting in the church, you know, right now. Because if we don't really understand a lot of the behind the scenes details of the Bible, we may not understand really what's going on here. But, you know, you got to imagine here's this blind beggar and he's on the side of the road and he already understands something about Jesus. He's calling him the son of David. Now, you got to understand that if you're, if you're Jewish or if you're an Israelite by descent, then what you were expecting was that the son of David was going to be the Messiah. You know, there was a scripture that was a prophecy that was given in 2 Samuel, which was the Old Testament prophet, that said that the seed of David would rule on the throne as king for all generations. And we know that that wasn't talking about it, it had a direct reference to Solomon, his, his offspring, but, it, but the whole prophecy couldn't be responded, speaking of just Solomon, because Solomon died. And so there was going to be an eternal king. And so all of the people of Israel, they waited and they longed for the day when that king would arrive, when that Messiah would arrive. And I'm just letting you know that the whole crowd is aware that Jesus is there, the, the crowd is following, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and this blind beggar, he understands who Jesus is, and he cries out to him, and, and he calls him son of David, and he says, have mercy on me. And many charged him, or in other words, we would say today, many demanded him. And this is what they demanded him, that he should hold his peace. <laughs> Keep quiet, you blind beggar. Don't open up your mouth again. Keep your mouth quiet. But this is what he did. But he cried the more a great deal. Don't you love that? When somebody won't be, succumb to pressure whenever they stand up for what they know is right and they don't listen to what the crowd's telling them. Listen, sometimes that's not easy, man. The crowd's screaming and telling you. To, you know, I was just watching the news this morning. Oh, Lord, I'm not trying to get political, I promise you. But it's just something that I'm thinking of. I don't even know what a canvasser is, but supposedly something to do with electoral whatever, and that there were two people in Michigan that did not agree with the way things went, and this and these people were not going to certify the vote. And they showed one of them going through the airport, and there was this mob around him, and they were they were accosting him while he was in the airport. I mean, they were screaming that. And come to find out on the news, they said that under pressure, they they changed their mind. And they went ahead and they certified it. And then they probably felt guilty about it because they didn't think it was the right thing to do. And they tried to take it back. And they were like, nope, what you doing? It's done. I mean, it's still, you know, they got still court things and stuff like that. But what I'm trying to say is the mob doesn't rule, my friend. And sometimes you may find yourself in the midst of a situation. And those, this is like blind Bartimaeus. He stood his ground because you know what? It's very life dependent on it. His very sight depended on it. Sometimes we got to be desperate in order to stand up for whatever we believe is right. I'm not talking about politics this morning. I'm talking about Jesus and I'm talking about your relationship with God. And I'm talking about your walk with the Lord and your stance for Christ. And if it's not important enough in you to take a stand when the mob around you is saying that something else is the right way. And your heart is saying, no, that's not right. Blind Bartimaeus said, I cry out all the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. Boy, isn't that good? And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, 
Rise, he calleth thee. And said unto him, Wait, I'm sorry. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What is it that you want from me? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. The next story I want to share with you comes out of Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 26. Acts 16, 22 through 26. Now this story right here, just to give you a little bit of the background of what's been going on. Paul and Silas have been walking through the streets in this city and they've been preaching Jesus. And you'll, you'll remember the story, but the Bible says that there was a woman with a spirit of divination. And with that, if you look it up in the Greek, it's, a, it's called a spirit of python. All right? She basically was, you can take the information, background biblical information, and you can come to this conclusion. She was likely a temple prostitute. She was possessed with a devil. She was basically like Sister Chloe. She could tell people about their business with the help of demon spirits. She would tell, like whenever you get your fortune read, she would tell people about their future and people paid a lot of money to have that service done. Well, she had owners. She was like a, a servant, a slave woman. And so she's following around. Now, what's interesting is, is that she's following around and she's actually what she's saying is true. Because she's following them around and she's saying, these men be of the most high God. These men be of the Lord. And every day, whenever Paul and Silas go out there to preach and to tell people about Jesus, here's this woman and she's following behind them and she's saying all that. But, you know, there's a problem. And I've seen this in other churches before where people, they act like they're doing the right thing. But, but what you'll notice is, is that they want the attention on themselves. That's a problem. The attention is not supposed to be focused on the preacher. The attention is not supposed to be focused on the music ministry. The attention is supposed to be focused on Jesus. And if you notice that spirit in a person, I'm telling you right now, it's not of the Lord. And if you yourself have found yourself liking all the attention to be put on you, then we all need to come to grips with the reality that that's not of the Lord. Anyway, what happened was, is after a while, Paul got tired of it. Paul's like, you're a lying devil. You might be telling the truth, but you're a lying devil. You're trying to take the glory off of God and put it on yourself. And he said, I rebuke it. And he rebuked that spirit that came out of her. And all of a sudden, she couldn't do what she was doing anymore. And her owners became angry. And they had power. Don't you know people with money have power in the community a lot of times? Right? And they had the authorities to, to do something about it. And so here we are in verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates or the leaders rent off their clothes. So they just ripped their clothes off naked in the middle of the public and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, in other words, they beat them with a whip so bad that their back skin was all flayed open and bleeding. I, I'm just trying to give you a picture of how bad this situation is. Can you just read over it and just like, oh, okay, no big deal. No, it's a big deal. And cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. I don't really know exactly what that means, but it sounds dark to me. And that's the point that I want you to hear. And made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight. Hallelujah. I'll probably put it in my notes somewhere, but I don't know that there's a darker time than midnight. The sun's fully down. The moon might be up, but... It's the darkest of time. It's the middle of the night. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. 
for however long this message takes, the title of my message that I've, that I, that I've titled it to, to this morning is My Dungeon Flamed with Light. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would give me the strength, Lord, that you would anoint my lips to speak forth your word, that you would use me as a vessel to speak the truth of your gospel. Lord, I pray for every hearer of this message, whether they be online or in the sanctuary, that their hearts, Lord, would be receptive to the truth, that you would allow spiritual revelation to take place. Lord, a person can say the truth, say the right thing multiple times, but until your Holy Spirit unlocks the key that provides revelation, it never truly sinks in. Help me, Lord God, to preach what I believe you put on my heart, my dungeon flamed with light. So these two stories, <laughs> excuse me, don't really seem to have any connection on the surface. But when I consider what God was putting on my heart, these are the two stories that came to mind. And while neither episode speaks about light, both stories are full of great darkness before the intervention of God. Amen? Both are cloaked in hopelessness and despair. There is feeling of depression and no way out. It was the midnight hour, like I said. Is there a darker hour in the night than that? When you feel overwhelmed with heartache and despair, heartache connected to your own life and circumstances, or heartache connected to the people you love. Let me slow down right there a little bit. Heartache connected to the people that you love. Do you ever go through situations that I can tell you right now, I got some heartache in my own life that I'm dealing with, with, with someone that I love very much. And every day that I wake up, in this particular situation, the light as of yet hasn't shined. It doesn't mean that the light's not going to show up. But as of yet, in that particular situation and circumstance, the light of God has not shown up in that particular circumstance. And I don't know what you're facing in your own life, whether it's your personal life or people that you love. But what I'm trying to say is, is that it don't get no darker than the midnight hour. Sometimes the despair and the feeling of hopelessness, it'll try to engulf you. It'll try to overwhelm you and try to hold you down. But I got good news for you this morning. I'm here to talk to you about life. The midnight hour spiritually represents the darkest and the most hopeless point in that trial that you or someone else might be facing. Blind Bartimaeus was stuck on the roadside of life and unable to work. Unable to do much of anything for himself. There was no braille in those days, which would have afforded a blind person an opportunity for some type of learning or education. Some sources say his cloak would have been issued by the government. I have a hard time exactly proving that, but that's what many a scholar or commentator would say, that certain cloaks were issued by the government and that it gave him an identity and it allowed everyone to know that he was legally allowed to beg and that, you know, it was all on the up and up. At the very least, though, the word for cloak there describes a large cloak or a large garment, and it's well known that these were used that people would use them to sleep in. Second Timothy, the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy in his second letter when he was in prison in Rome before he got his head cut off, he mentions the cloak. He mentions it, he mentions it to Timothy. He says, hey, when you make it this way, bring the, 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 the rolls or the papyrus, the, talking about the writings, uh, okay? But don't forget the cloak. Because you see, he was in a dungeon. He was in a prison. It's still there today. I've told to you about it before. It's called the Mamertine Prison in Rome. It's very deep. It's dark. It was musty. It was cold. It was damp. Bring the cloak. So at the very least, the cloak represents for blind Bartimaeus a very important part of his life. Likely, it was spread out before him during the day, uh, hoping that people would throw money on it so that he could eat that night. At night, he, he would probably tuck himself into it and curl up and hug it tightly to keep the cold air off of him. No matter, in some fashion, his cloak is a reminder of the hopelessness of his situation. Because it's likely his only possession. Day after day, stuck in the same spot, spreading out the same cloak. 
Have you ever felt like you were stuck in the same spot and that you couldn't get out? Maybe you've never been there before, but I can tell you that somebody listening today, somebody in this room, if they were honest, there's been a time in their life that they felt like they were stuck. Stuck in a rut and they couldn't. You ever been stuck in a vehicle? Listen, I've done some crazy things, but I've like actually tried to go off-roading in a vehicle that didn't even have four-wheel drive before. I've been stuck on more than one occasion and my wheels just spinning and I wasn't making any movement forward. I think about that person that I love very much and I've been thinking about her a lot lately and I've been thinking that spiritually she's probably feeling like she's stuck. And maybe somebody that you know feels like they're stuck and they're never going to be able to get out. They're never going to be able to get free. I remember one of the darkest times in my life when I lived in Lafayette before I had really completely surrendered to Jesus. And I was, I mean, it was a mess. I don't want to get into all the detail, but it was dark. It was dark and my life was full of despair. And I do, I can remember feeling stuck. How will I ever get out of this place? And then the prison story where Paul and Silas are stripped and naked and beaten and thrown into a prison. There's one line that says, and their feet fast in the stocks. The word fast means to secure. There was no getting out of here. They were stuck in a dark and a dingy prison. Imagine the despair. Imagine the feelings of hopelessness. Imagine the pain and the depression trying to set in. You know what I'm talking about? Surely you've been there before. Yeah, surely you've, you've felt the loneliness. That's the, that's the, that's the worst of all, right? When you, when you start to feel like you're so alone and isolated. You know, it's true that neither story speaks of light entering in. But in both cases, that's exactly what happened. In both cases, light entered into darkness and brought great freedom and release from impossible situations and circumstances. And that's really the main thought that I want to get across this morning. How the light of God can and will suddenly penetrate the darkest places, the most hopeless of situations, and sometimes seemingly in the last of seconds, when you least expected it. All of a sudden, the light of God, you're like, you've been believing God even because you're a believer and you know, you believe what the preacher said. You believe what you read. You believe that God is more than able and capable to deliver you from the midst of your situation. But you keep believing him. And day after day and week after week, and it seems like year after year, you're believing him and nothing is really happening. And then all of a sudden, a suddenly, and the light of God floods in, the, the light of God diffuses and hallelujah light expels the darkness and you're able that situation that you were in now you see freedom and liberty you know what our job is through it all our job through it all no matter how long it takes no matter how dark it gets no matter listen to me how unfair it seems is to hold on to God through it all Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Listen, that's who we're looking to. We're looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. We're, he despised the shame. Do you know that? Do you realize that Jesus did not want to hang naked on the cross? Did anybody? Newsflash. Who wants to hang naked on a cross in front of the public to be displayed and ridiculed? as a common criminal. Do you think that that's what somebody wants to do? Like in their humanity. You do realize that Jesus was human. You do realize that God became man. He never, yes, he never stopped being God, but he did not, he didn't die on the cross as God. He died on, God didn't need to die. Does that make sense what I'm telling you this morning? God didn't need to die. God didn't mess up. God was perfect. God was sinless. Man was the sinful one. Therefore, God had to become man. So that God could die in place of man. 
But again, God didn't die in man. Jesus was a man. You realize that. Isn't that all? Well, you know, how many times I used to say it too, so I don't feel bad if you said it yesterday. Well, I'm not Jesus. Well, we realize that, but that's, that's a poor excuse, brothers and sisters. Because the same spirit that raised him from the dead also will quicken your mortal body. Amen. That means the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you if you're born again. That means that Holy Ghost, hallelujah, that, that can bring light in the midst of darkness lives on the inside of you and can strengthen you and will empower you to stand up, to get up, and to be able to do the will of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. You know what the joy was? Certainly not hanging naked on that cross. The joy was seeing you free. The joy was seeing you in eternal self because that was the Father's will. The Father's will was that you and I would be free. So Jesus willingly humbled himself. He, he for went the, the throne and the portals of glory that he was the word that spoke the world into existence and he humbly allowed himself to be incarnated in flesh. To clothe himself in flesh. Hebrews 2 and 14. Because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he became the same. He became us so that he could die for us, so that he could endure for us, so that he could pay the penalty for us. Because we were against God. Do you realize that? Oh, I don't like it when you say that, preacher. Well, I'm sorry. Word of God says you were an enmity with God. What does that mean? An enemy of God. There was hostility between you and God, but oh, hallelujah. God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. God the Father loved you. He loved me and he sent his son to be flesh, sinless flesh, to die on that cross, to pay the penalty. He despised the shame, but guess what? He endured it. He endured it, and now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and this is who we look to. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. So listen, no matter how dark it gets, no matter bad, how bad it gets, no matter how painful it is, you're to look to Jesus. I gotta remind you of that. I, why do I gotta remind you? Because I gotta remind myself sometimes that I gotta keep looking to Jesus. There is no alternative, my friend. Oh, there's a lot of them out there that the world will offer you. That your friends will offer you. There's a whole lot of people out there. Listen to me. Oh, you're such a... I, I, you don't even know I've heard it all before. You're such a mean preacher. You're so hypercritical. You're so critical of other people. You know, the world out there, they're Christians. Where, well, maybe they are. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not here to judge the soul of a man. That's not my job. But I will tell you one thing, when people just move forward with their own decisions in their own lives that are completely contrary to this, after they've been told it's wrong, what do we do with that? What, what is going on? Is, it, is God winking at sin? Is God okay with us continuing to make those same decisions and then we just paint some scripture and we act like it's okay? Well, if that's the kind of preacher you want, you need to go find him somewhere else. Because the last thing that I want to do is misrepresent the word of God. Lord knows your preacher got his own problems in his own life that he needs God to get a hold of. But at the same time, Lord, no matter what, please help me to always present your word for the way that it is written, the way that you desire for it to go forward, that I would never compromise the word of God because it is his word. And his people have a right to hear it. I don't know why, but I just got the idea of fake news. And Lord, we don't want no fake news. We don't want no fake news. We want the truth, and then we want to be able to determine what we're going to do with it afterwards. Amen? Hallelujah. Anything else, and we become a quitter. Like, in other words, looking to Jesus... The author and the finisher of our faith. We hold on to him. Anything else we become a quitter. We give up on hope. You let Jesus walk by as you cuddled your cloak. Instead of singing a song to put your mind on Jesus, you looked at the darkness and you gave up on hope and life. That's the alternative. I'm going to tell you a quick story. 
Her name was Alice Jones. Y'all heard of her? She spoke at the Republican National Convention. It's the coolest story, man. Alice Jones. I don't even know how old she is. Probably in her 60s, maybe, I'm guessing. Complete guess. African-American lady. She served 21 years of a life sentence for a nonviolent drug charges. And one day she got a call. Listen, it's crazy. craziest story you ever heard of. Kim Kardashian called Donald Trump and told him the story. But let me tell you something. Don't you be giving glory to Kim Kardashian and don't you even be giving glory to Donald Trump. I mean, yeah, they all paid a part in it, but let me tell you. This woman was serving 21 years of a life sentence. Now, she admitted, Danielle, I asked Danielle to read the story to me or give me the cliff notes. And basically, I don't remember what city, but it was a big city and there was a big, there was a big drug kind of thing going on and she played like an intermediary role. I think she was just kind of passed and she had about seven charges, but none of it was violent, whatever the case, but life for that. Life, okay, she served 21 years. And then one day out of nowhere, she got a call. Hey, Kim called Donald, guess what? You getting out tomorrow, my friend. But the crazy part of the story is, is that all them 21 years, I don't know what that woman was praying, but she was praying something because she came out a different person than when she went in. She was actually like a pastor. She was a woman of God. She was talking about the things of God. And what I'm trying to say, I get the goosebumps thinking about it because I'm here to tell you, God knew the whole time. God was watching. Is everybody going to get out of prison? No, that's not what I'm saying. And all those prisoners in there, I've been to prison ministry a few times, and I've known some people that have been in prison. And many times you can tell that there's people that are praying, and that's really what they're concerned about, is they're praying to just get out of prison. Nobody's ever taken the time to realize, hold on a second, Hoss, you're in here for a reason. And what you really need to do is you need to humble yourself and you need to serve God while you're in here each and every day, each and every week, each and every year. you got to make a choice because they, guess what? Just in prison, they got the church and they got the world. And you're going to have to make a choice. You're either going to serve Jesus in prison or you're not. And if you say, if you play the game, guess what? You might end up going back. And that's, you know, that's one of the problems that people... Say so. I don't even know why I'm going off on this. I guess because I talked about Alice Jones, but oh, he got jailhouse religion. Let me tell you something. Some of the most real believers that I've ever met were inside prison walls, and some of those people probably ended up going back to prison. That doesn't mean that it wasn't real. The reality of it is, is that there's a lot to be understood about the Word of God. And people mean well in their hearts. And if they don't understand how to access proper faith and to receive the grace that they need, many of us succumb to our old ways. Many of us succumb to the old man. And some people's old man's worse than another person's old man. And if you and I, some people just cheat on their wife every now and then. Some people go back to smoke and crack and, 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 and start going into criminal activity whenever they do that. Is one worse than the other? No, it's all sin and God's not okay with any of it. Amen. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Is that the right attitude, the right motivation is no matter where I am, no matter how dark it is, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how much despair there is, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, believing God each and every day, that one day that light of God is going to burn inside of that dungeon and it's going to bring light and life into my situation. It's God's will and God's timing and he shows up and moves at the best time. Amen? Amen. He shows up and moves at the best time. Not your time, not my time. Right. The best time. Okay. Hey, hallelujah. And you and I have a choice. We will either believe him in the darkness while we're waiting, or again, we will give up. I was thinking of a song that I mentioned to Naya, and a specific line to the song kept ringing in my ears. I tried to email it to Manuel. Did you, were you able to get that? I asked him to put it up there. <laughs> this is a, I, heard him play, I heard her playing it this morning, so I guess they're going to try to learn it. This is an old Charles Wesley hymn. It was redone, but Charles Wesley was John Wesley's brother. 
It's older English. But listen, you gotta you gotta look at the words to this. Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Just think about it. Oh, just think about the word. Have you ever been bound up? Have you ever felt like your spirit man or your soul was in a prison? And that you know you know what one of the problems is? If we've never truly been set free, we might not realize we're still in a prison today. That's it. That's what part of the problem for Christians is. Amen. If we've never truly been set free, we might not realize that we're still in a prison right now. But he said, long my imprisoned spirit lay, it was fast bound in sin in nature. Now, in other words, I was in darkness. Yeah. I was bound up by sin. I was bound up in darkness. But, oh man, this is the part that gets me. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I don't know what that means to you, but let me break it down for you what it means to me. The eye of God saw where this poor sinner lay. The eye, nothing goes past the eye of God. The eye of God sees your situation and circumstance. The eye of God knows exactly where you are. He has heard your cry. He has counted every tear. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. The lying devil and all your friends around you like Job's friends might lie to you and tell you to quit and to give up because God had not been good to you. Don't you listen to the lies. Keep holding on to Jesus. Even if your spouse don't come. Even if your children don't come. Hold on to Jesus because the eye of God is watching you and he loves you hallelujah and he's, and he's there for you but one day the eye, the eye of God diffused a quickening ray what is that talking about it's talking about a burst of light hallelujah just like the just like a ray of sunlight and look what happened I woke you want to talk about being woke this morning hallelujah that's the new thing now I'm woke look what you woke to I want to be woke to Jesus I want to be woke to the truth I want my blinded eyes to be open hallelujah the son of David have mercy on me open up my eyes that I might be able to see it but look what happened. I woke and guess what happened? The dungeon. Was he really in a dungeon? I don't think that he was ever in a dungeon. Not the writer of the song. He's talking about it spiritually speaking. He was, he was bound up in a dungeon. But this dungeon flamed with light. Hallelujah. My chains fell off. Yes, yes. My heart was free. Oh, how long for freedom. To grab a hold of my heart. Hallelujah. To be free in the name of Jesus. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Now I got to tell you something. I first heard this song after my sister died, tragically. And one morning, I woke up. I've told y'all the story before. I don't know how else to describe it. But I told God, Lord, love her for me like I never loved her. And all of a sudden, I fell on my knees. I had been in church. Come on, Christian. I had been in church for 12 years. I had sang the songs. Yeah. I had gone to church all those times. But when I hit my knees on that morning, my God. a quickening ray showed up in the middle of that living room. Hallelujah. It was as though heaven had opened up and a grace just poured out. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now, I made a lot of mistakes since that day, but my life ain't never been the same. Amen. A quickening Amen. ray diffused. My heart had been in a dungeon and I didn't even know it. I, I knew I was a sinner. I knew I kept messing up, but something happened that morning when the light of God showed up on the inside of my heart showed up on the inside of my situation and showed me you don't have to be a slave anymore. You don't have to live in a darkened dungeon. The eye of God diffused a quickening ray and woke you up and gave you life and then you realized you were free. And then once you realize you're free, you know when you ain't going in the right direction. And you gotta make a choice on who you're gonna serve. Hallelujah. And that was one thing that happened. You know, I pray it still to Today. I still pray it today. I tell people still today, the world ain't got nothing for me, friend. That's it. I'm not going to tell you that I'm never tempted. I'm just like you. I'm a human being. The world tries to tempt me with whatever flavor of temptation that Matt would like. 
But Matt don't want to go back to the world. I don't know where you want to live, but I, they ain't got nothing for me. That party is a lie, dude. I done did the party. Oh, I got knee deep, sick, drunk, jacked up, did all. And I'm, this is TG13 and Leeds. Just forgive me. I did everything that the world could offer. Right. And then some. They said, give it to me, man. Let's do it more. Let's do it more. And guess what? It left me empty. It left me broken. It left me in pain. It left me in darkness. It left me maybe a slave in a dungeon where there was no hope. But then on that day, the eye of God diffused the quickening ray. Hallelujah. Light entered in my heart. I'm here to tell you he's good. I'm here to tell you he's good. I got a report from the other side, church. Yeah. He's good. Hallelujah. Yeah. And he's worthy to be worshipped. And he's worthy to be lived for. And the world is a lie. It's a facade. That's it. And it keeps tinkering around with your heart and with your life. And it's putting a little carrot out front of your nose and saying, come on, just one more time. Come on. Just get you a little bit, just a little nibble. Come on, one more time. No, that is a lion, rotten carrot, and it's only going to lead you down a wrong That's it, right? course, That's it. and it's only going to lead to spiritual bondage. Right, right. What a chorus of hope the song sings. To have been a blind spiritual beggar, to have been spiritually imprisoned and without hope of release, and then suddenly the light of God floods in and changes everything in an instant. What hope! What joy would flood the soul to have been bound but then set free, to have been lost and then to be found in Christ. The light of God is a beautiful thing. The light of God is a powerful thing. The light of God heals blindness and opens prison doors. That's what Jesus said he came to do. Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. This is exactly what Jesus said that he came to do. Look what it says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus talking. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You know, we listen, I've been in Pentecostal type churches since I got saved back way back when I was 13. That was the first time I bowed my knee at an altar was when I was 13, Twin City Gospel Temple. That's where I got really saved when I was 17 or 19 when I went up to the altar. And I heard so many, so many stories, and I believe every last one of them. By the grace, now, I mean, I'm not saying there ain't no lying preachers out there, but I know God that healed blinded eyes today. You hear me? God will make a lame man walk. But we've so, been so concerned in Pentecost and charismatic churches to see somebody jump up out of a wheelchair and run around the church or to see somebody with blinded eyes to be able to, to receive their sight again that we're forgetting the spiritual implication that there's people that are spiritually blind, that there's people that are spiritually lame, that people can't walk for the Lord, can't see the truth. Do you realize that people, all that stuff that we talked about earlier, all the atmosphere of the nation that we're living in, all the changes that are taking place, People literally believe that they're heading in the right direction. Do you realize that those people are blind? Mm -hmm. They're spiritually blind. Yeah. They can't see. Yeah. And, it, and if you're not careful, it'll try to grab a hold of you. Yes, sir. It'll try to, it'll try to put blindness on you. That's right. Let's talk a little bit about the light. Look at John chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. It says, then spoke Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. But look at this. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, you bear record of yourself and your record is not true. And that's just like the devil. I mean, look, this is the word of God. This is no, literally, <laughs> literally, Jesus is the word made flesh. And he's saying, I am the light of the world. I've come so that you don't have to walk in darkness. Right. What does the lying devil do? He turns around and says, you bear record of yourself and your record is not true. The same devil that was in these religious folks then is the same devil that tries to live today. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to convince you that the word of Jesus isn't real. Right. And if Jesus said that he can deliver you from darkness, if Jesus said that he can set you free and help you walk in the light, then by all means, let's believe him. Because Jesus said, I have come to deliver them out of darkness that they might have light. And he says, if you'll follow me, you won't walk in darkness. You can see Jesus ain't walking 
into darkness. Uh, he might walk into darkness to deliver people out of it, but he ain't going to lead you into darkness. Jesus is going to lead you in the light. Amen? Amen? Look at John chapter 1, verse 5. I actually changed the version on this. In John chapter 1, verse 5, I actually used the ESV version. And the reason why is for that word comprehended it not, because a real literal translation in the Greek is that it overcame it not. So in my little, in my little notes, I have the ESV version because it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I got good news for you. There might be darkness alive and well out there, but guess what? The darkness has not overpowered the light. The darkness has not overcome the light. Sometimes it might look like it, but I'm here to tell you that it's not so. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. The scripture says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Now, I don't have time to break this down, but there's a lot of scriptural evidence that shows that the reason that there was darkness on the earth at that time when God created was because of the fall of the angel that we was called Lucifer, that now we refer to as Satan, that when he fell in the past, that it caused the original creation to be. And there's scriptural evidence to back this up, but we don't have time to break it down. The main point that I'm trying to make for you today is this. The same way that there was physical darkness on the earth and God said, let there be light and the Holy Spirit allowed light to come upon the earth it, for you, for me. There may be spiritual darkness in our life, but where God says, let there be light, hallelujah, the light will shine in that place. Last scripture that I wanted to share, I'm not done yet, but last scripture that I want to share about light is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, you are a chosen generation. Talking about you, the Christian, Christian, Christian soldiers, amen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A peculiar people. I mean, we don't really have time to get into that, but you're. But if you're a true believer, you're peculiar. Why are you peculiar? Well, you're different than the world. Did, did, did we understand that? I hope that we're getting a hold of that in this church by now. Right. You, you can't. If you're truly a follower of Christ, if you're truly a disciple of Christ, you can't look just like the world. Sorry, friend, it don't work like that. This don't build churches and don't put fannies in the seed, but it just is the truth. That if we're going to live for Jesus, we can't keep looking just like the world. Yeah, yeah. Help me out, somebody. That's it. I remember what it was like being a kid. I remember what it was like in my teenage days. I remember the things that we talked about on the playground. And it wasn't usually Jesus. <laughs> Kids nowadays when they're at school, they probably... Most of their friends probably ain't talking about Jesus. That's it. What does that do to our Christianity? Whenever we're at work and we're wanting to be cool with the rest of the crowd and they ain't talking about Jesus, what is that going to do for our friendships and our little social groups? Well, I don't know what to tell you. But Jesus is different. And you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a peculiar people. Yeah. You're different. Yep. Amen? That you should show forth the praises of Him that has called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. When the light of God enters our life, He expects us to follow the light and allow it to lead us out of darkness. After we're saved, it's God's intent that we would stay away from darkness. It's not God's will that His people remain blind. It's not God's will that his people remain imprisoned in spiritual bondage. All right. I'm about to close with three quick points. You ready? Close it with three quick points. Point number one, get up and walk. Amen? Get up and walk. In verse 50 of the blind Bartimaeus story, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to tell you. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Sometimes one of the first things you have to do is you just got to get up and walk. Walk where, preacher? Away from darkness and towards Jesus. Away from darkness, whatever that is. I'm not the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm just trying to tell you about the Word of God. Whatever the Lord's been dealing with you about. Do you pray? Do you read the Word? Do you hear the Word of God? 
Whenever you start walking in a particular direction, is the Holy Spirit talking to you? Yes, he is. And he's knocking and he's saying, don't go there. Don't walk there. Get up and walk until you're ready to leave the misery of the lies and the darkness and the hopelessness and get up and walk away from it. Then you will remain right there in the middle of it. But God says, get up and trade your cloak for Christ and walk away from the darkness and into the light. Hallelujah. Don't cling to your cloak. Cling to Christ. Walk away from the past. Hallelujah, that have held you in bondage and walk to the newness and the freedom that Jesus offers. That was number one. Just get up and walk. Number two, don't give up. Amen. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Whatever you do, don't give up. And listen, when the world starts trying to make you quit, when the world starts telling you lies, then you know you're heading in the right direction. Whatever you do, don't give up. You know, everybody told him to shut up. Shut up, dude. You're embarrassing. Can you imagine that? You ever been around something like that where somebody's saying something that's embarrassing you feel all cringy? You know what I'm talking about? Shut up, dude. You're embarrassing. You're embarrassing yourself. You're embarrassing us. You're going to embarrass him. Stop. This is his kingly procession. He doesn't have time to be seen with a blind and dirty beggar. Excuse me? You're a disciple, sir? No, this is a disciple talking like that. Yes, yes. Oh, people don't like you. Oh, you can't talk about the disciple. Like, oh, yes, I can. Because they didn't even see it. Oh, they're going to get it in about 10 to 20 years from now. But right now, they don't see it right. They're all like, shh, stop, man. You're, you're weird, dude. You're making everybody feel uncomfortable. Right, right. <laughs> you're a disciple and you don't even know the Jesus you're walking with, sir. You will understand better in about 10 to 20 years, but right now you're like all the other religious leaders, false pastors, men and women who choose to twist the scriptures and are only interested in getting something instead of giving something. No, my Jesus came to give. My Jesus came to give his life. Hallelujah. So that it could be shared. Amen. So I could walk out of darkness and into his marvelous life. You want me to cling to this cloak because this is who you say I am. Let me show you what I will do with this cloak. Yes. Sir, yes. I'm not going to cling to this cloak. Right. I'm not what the world says, a spirit, a, a, a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not, oh, Lord, my little orange dot came on. I don't know if it's true, but Danielle said when they got an orange dot on your phone or your watch, they're listening to you. Do you believe that? I don't know. She sent me some article. Uh -oh. I got an orange dot on my watch. Well, guess what? If it's yeah. true, it is, then whatever it may be, listen close. Yeah. If you're listening, Jesus Christ came to die to set you free too, sir. Yeah. They might say, oh, you're LGBT. No, 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 no. Jesus created you the way that you were supposed to be. And the light of God will diffuse a quickening ray and pull you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're in bondage, sir. Whatever you're living under, you are not happy. You are not free. You keep jumping from one thing to the next, trying to find happiness. And what I'm here to tell you is this. Jesus is the only answer for your soul. You're telling me to cling to this cloak. You're telling me I'm always going to be a drug addict. You're telling me I'm always going to be an alcoholic. No, no, no. That's contrary to the word of God. I read the Bible. And the Bible said that I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. That's what I choose to believe. I choose to believe the word of God. I choose to believe Jesus. The one who rose from the dead. How do you know he rose from the dead, preacher? Because he lived right here. I can feel it in my heart. I saw when the light of God showed up, hallelujah, and infiltrated my darkness and gave me strength to get up and to walk away. Amen. To throw that cloak Amen. to the side. I'm not going to cling to that cloak. Hallelujah. That's my past. Hallelujah. And that's not who I am. Yes. And every day I move towards the light, I move further and further away from that darkness. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now, you need to walk away from the darkness and you need to move to the light. I throw it to the side. I cling to Jesus. Now watch my life, Christian. Watch your life. You just watch and see where he brings me now. You watch and see where he brings you now when you cling, yeah. when you when you throw away that cloak and you cling to Christ. Watch where he will bring you if you will trust him. Yes. Is it easy? No, I'm not telling you that it's easy. Is it going to be hard? Everybody's going to be against you. 
But Jesus will be for you. Amen. Hallelujah. And he will give you what you need. Whatever you do, don't give up. Everyone around you is going to tell you to quit. But you need to be like that widow in Luke. For sake of time. It said there was a widow in the city and she kept knocking on the door of the judge and she kept saying, hey, hey, won't you give me what it is that I need? And the, wicked, the judge said, I'm wicked. He didn't call himself a wicked man. He said, I don't even believe God. I don't fear God. But man, this woman, she keeps on bothering me. I'm getting wore out. I'm getting weary. I'm about to give this woman what she's asking for because I'm tired, man. If I don't, if I don't give it to her, she's just going to keep on knocking. She's just going to keep on asking, man. Let me get this woman out of my hair. And the scripture says in verse 6 of that chapter, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? It might seem long your imprisoned spirit lay. It might seem like God is bearing long with you but I'm here to tell you hallelujah he heard your cry keep crying don't quit keep bringing your petitions before him and letting him know what it is that you're asking of him amen, amen. last point closing with this Naya could you whoever's going to come sing could you sing us a song I just want you to know that he's still worthy so remember to praise him anyway amen He's worthy, even in the midst of darkness, even in the midst of pain. He's worthy. Listen, this temporary life we're living is going to give way one day. That's it. We're either going to go to the grave and, and then later get a new a, a glorified body or we're going to be here when the Lord comes back. Either way, I'm here to tell you this. What we're experiencing is temporary. Don't cling to your cloak for some temporary moment. Let that go and embrace Jesus. With stripes on their backs, feet fast in the stocks and lying in agony on a cold, wet prison floor in the darkness of night. I can imagine it in my heart and my head, church. It might have started with a whimper, but a whimper turned to a praise and a praise to a shout. And then there's light, the light of God, an earthquake from God, the freedom of God. Yes. Lead us in worship, Nile. Let's exalt the King. He's worthy to be praised, even if he hasn't done anything. If you need prayer this morning, the altars are open. Amen.